Hi everyone, welcome to the, this public free Q&A call that I'm doing, uh, especially to support everybody during these um, difficult times that we are living through, uh, this global crisis um, of coronavirus, economic uh, depression really is what it's starting to look like. And especially those of us who are business owners, I mean, we everyone is losing, you know, so many people are losing their work, but business owners have it really hard as well because most of us don't have some kind of cushion from the company or something like that. So um, that's why we're here in part. There have been a lot of questions that have been submitted to me. So I'm going to start with those submitted questions. But those of you who are here live, feel free to chat your questions below um, as we go. I'd love to, for you to introduce yourself uh, below the video in the chat area, comments or chat. And the questions, I have four questions for you. One is where are you in the world? Second one is introduce your business a little bit. So who is your ideal client and what do you do for them? Third is how are you feeling in these times? And fourth is any words of encouragement to those who are feeling down, uh, maybe you in these times. So I look forward to seeing your responses below as I keep talking. Um, so those of you who are live here have to do a little bit of multitasking if you wish to. You don't have to respond if you don't want to. But let me go ahead and, and go right to the questions and uh, we'll get as much done as we can today. Yeah. All right. So first question is from Ian. And let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. Okay. So Ian says, with so much uncertainty in our current environment, how do we continue to make our business offers with so many people having to cut their expenses? Even though I, uh, I know people that need coaching now more than ever. Yeah, I totally, totally agree with you. Um, so I actually responded to this in, in the first call towards somewhere towards the beginning. So I encourage you to watch the first call as well. But I'll just say a little bit more here. Maybe I'll say something different. <laughs> Who knows? And um, so here's the thing. Uh, yes, people need uh, support now more than ever, okay? Yes, if you make offers that are special to these times that are paid offers, right? Um, it may come across as opportunistic, okay? So that's the reality of things. Which is why I so wish all of you have had a rhythm of making offers so that your audience knew, knows what your typical rhythm is. Like my audience knows that I always offer a new course every month or some course every month. So that's coming and I, I don't think my audience will think I'm opportunistic because that's just been my, you know, been, my, been my groove and they understand that. Um, but if you can, uh, however, um, <laughs> phrase it, right? Phrase it as your normal offer. Okay. Even if you haven't had a rhythm of making offers, just say that, Hey, this is something that I really love doing. And I feel like people especially need support in this time. And, but give some, some kind of benefit for these times. So, so, you know, benefit for these times might, might include some discount, right? Might include uh, free group things you know, free bonuses. Um, but, you know, I would, I would say if you have existing clients, right, maybe run it by existing or previous clients or colleagues first. That's what I would recommend. So I hope this is helpful and please feel free to ask any follow-up questions below. For those of you who are watching this later, um, I won't necessarily be able to answer your follow-up questions in depth, but I might be able to provide a few words of, um, of, of insight or you know, some, some few words of direction. So I hope this helps. And I, like I said, please feel free to watch the first part of uh, the Q&A, which is in a separate video where I say more about these kinds of things. Okay. All right, let's keep going to Leah's question, which is uh, related with the current requirement of social distancing. Do you or does anyone in the group have any suggestions for how I could set up and monetize regular live yoga classes using Zoom? Okay. So I do, um, 
And hi, Leah, you are here with us. So if you want to uh, add anything, feel free to, to share. Yeah, I think I've actually solved the problem. So, <laughs> but oh, please, it might uh, please share with us. You want to you want to share with us how what you're doing now? Yeah. So so I just signed up with Zoom for the paid monthly subscription, um, and through because my website is through Wix, I can actually set up an online booking system for people to book into those classes and pay online, um, and then they just get an email confirmation email with a link to the Zoom that I set up for each of those classes. So I did a trial run on Monday night. So I'm going to roll it out properly tomorrow. I'm going to create some uh, just screenshot videos of how to so some of my clients know how to, you know, log into the system, how to download Zoom, how to book into a class, you know, how they can pay. Um, and hopefully it all goes to plan. <laughs> we'll just wait yeah. and see. Yeah. Right, right. Excellent. Well, that sounds great. I, I love that. Yeah. And uh, I, hope, uh, I hope it goes well and I'm sure you'll learn a lot and it'll keep improving over, yeah. over time. Uh -huh. And I've, I've made the online class a little bit cheaper than my face-to-face -face class that I teach. So I normally charge 15 for a class. So the online, I'm just charging 12. So I'm hoping that that small discount might encourage people to still continue to practice yoga, even nice. though it's online. Mm. Wonderful. Mm. And what's your website? So those of us who are here can find out about it. Uh, it's called The Center of Key. I'll put the link in the chat if you like. Um, T-H-E, The Center, C-E-N-T-R. Oh, uh, yeah. So it's the Australian spelling, C E N T R E. C E N T R E of key is K I. K I, yeah. yeah. Okay. The, the center of key. Okay. You might want to you might want to buy the center of key American spelling anyway. <laughs> you can redirect it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. not a bad idea actually. Especially now you're you're doing online stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Well, yeah. Thanks for being here and sharing what you're up to. Um, Let's see, uh, Leah shares, shares what she'll be doing. Okay, cool. All right, um, Sharon is next. And Sharon asked, actually, um, kind of a similar question, but uh, I'm a, a craniosacral therapist, work one-on-one, -on -one, body contact. I've been thinking of ways to scale my business for some time. And of course, the current situation is, is making us do it even uh, faster, right? Um, I can do EFT tapping as well as offer Skype sessions, but I prefer physical touching and connecting with clients, obviously, in at least these next few months, that's probably not a, not a possible thing or not encouraged. Is it, it is still not scaling, however, and I wonder what else I can do to scale. All right. Okay. So, so, um, let's see here. Um, I want to I want to point you to my I have a blog post about business models. Uh, let's see, sorry, uh, business model. Mm, there it is. So it's georgecow.com/blog/business/model. Okay, um, and um, and I I really hope you'll you know, really think about this. Uh, there's a reason why I, I call it simple because why not keep it simple? <laughs> okay. Why not keep it simple? Uh, because if this model works, use it. And if you have any challenges based on this model, you can, you know, ask me and we can go further from there. But, uh, let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger here. All right. So basically, this goes from you in the center where your clients have the most access to you all the way out to free content where the clients have or the people have least access to you. It also goes from where you can have the most transformation down here, the people closest to you, you can, you know, the people that you can impact one to one, you have the most uh, transformational power with, for them, with them, uh, all the way out here to free content where you should give yourself the least amount of pressure to make change in people's lives with your free content. You should also give yourself very little pressure to try to make people's lives transform through your books and, you know, relatively less pressure, relatively more pressure, but still not very much pressure with online courses. Uh, when I teach my online and then group programs and the one-to-one. -one. So it kind of goes from 
uh, where you most scalable, right? Most scalable is free content. You could really touch the world. That's why this is dotted. Dotted lines are, you know, it's very porous. You know, as many people as possible can consume your free content. You're making little impact per person. Yeah, you know, of course, some people will consume your free content. It changes their life. But you're not giving yourself that kind of pressure to change everybody's life who watches this must have a radical life change. No, you're giving yourself too much pressure and you're giving people too much pressure when you, when you say that, right? Uh, books, again, it, it just kind of goes down towards most, not most pressure, but at least most expectation of transformation, least expectation of transformation, most cost per person, least cost per person. Most, uh, most people access to you, least people access to you, okay? It kind of goes in this order. So, um, so back to, you know, Sharon's question. Well, Sharon, can you, you know, now that you're not doing this money one-on-one -on -one clients, at least in person, of course, you can serve clients, like you said, via Skype, one-on-one, -on -one, via Zoom, whatever tool you want to use, it's fine. Could you create group programs where you're supporting a group of 10, 20, 50 clients, uh, you know, with more, you know, group calls, group Zoom calls, uh, you know, a Facebook private group, this kind of thing, right? And then beyond that, online courses, the difference between online courses and, and group programs is that online courses are, are scalable, are do-it-yourself, meaning anybody can buy them at any time just like my online courses are, and I'll just turn this off so we can, we can look at each other for a little bit here. Um, you know, my online courses, once I teach them live, they're for sale, you know, forever. So any of you can go to my, and I'll just, I'll just show you what I mean, right? Like if you, if you went to my website, um, go to services and then go to workshops, right? These are my online courses that I recorded uh, and they're available at any time. And by the way, if, if any of you haven't yet bought the Intro to Authentic Business Planning course, I, I really do recommend this because I, I offer, um, you know, week by week tracking system for your progress, et cetera. I don't mean to pitch it, but I really do feel strongly that this is an important course for everybody to take. Um, and that's my cheapest course right now, $50 US uh, one time payment. So um, and you get access, by the way, when you do this, you get access to two more months of my bonus Q&A calls. It's kind of like what I'm doing here on the free live calls, but I do that once a month for those the students. And you get, anyway, but you can see how once I've recorded something, it's available, it's scalable. It could be 10 people buying it, or it could be a thousand people buying it. It doesn't cost me any more effort. So that's what I recommend, Sharon, is that you create online, all, not just Sharon. I recommend this to all of you. Let's say that you are a really hands-on service provider. I provide massage. How can I create online courses? It's time to get creative. So can you brainstorm below? Let's brainstorm. Let's brainstorm. What are the most touchy? Okay. Massage. I want you to brainstorm this with me. How can a massage therapist create online courses? How can a acupuncturist create online courses those are two really hands-on things right like you can't do acupuncture virtually can't teach people acupuncture themselves shouldn't <laughs> probably um, how can they do online courses go ahead brainstorm I'll just be quiet for half a minute Okay, so let me just share some of the ideas coming through. Um, so Leia, uh, we saw we saw Leia earlier. Uh, Leia says, talk about some of the theory behind what you do. Get people a deeper understanding, and they can apply it to their life. That's true for all of us. We can teach online courses about the theory of what we do. Most of us don't have work that's super super hands on. Some of you do, like I said. That's why we're brainstorming. Um, Shweta says, how about self-healing techniques? Whether it's the acupuncturist or the massage therapist, you know you can teach self-healing, self-massage, 
a self acupressure, not acupuncture, you know, and, and other kind of holistic, um, you know, and yes, Judith, thank you. Judith gave us ideas, acupressure for emotional release. All right. You can teach self healing methods on different topics. You can teach courses, self massage for, you know, self massage can be on many different areas of the body, but you could teach on specific problems, self massage for sleep, self massage for, you know, headaches, self massage for Nate and fill in the blank. These are all different courses you can teach. Each course can just be somewhere between $25 to $50, right? And it could be, you know, it doesn't have to be long, right? It could be sh some short videos. People, people don't need long courses. They don't. They, they will prefer short courses that they could actually use and get through quickly. That's what people prefer. So do it. Sell it. $10, $25, $50. Try it. Once you do it, you'll realize, oh my God, your world's opened. Now you could create a whole suite of products. People buy my course once I, that's why I keep creating courses because guess what? People buy this here and there, that here and there. It just adds up passive income. Passive income originally is active income. You have to start creating things actively first, but eventually it becomes passive income. It's not always passive. It's not, it's not completely passive over time because you still are building an audience nurturing an audience, there's work involved. I think passive income is really only passive when you're investing in index funds. You know, Index funds, stock market, now is the time to invest. A year ago was not the time to invest, I invested. But even, even if you invested high over time, it still goes higher over time in seven to 10 year cycles. So anyway, um, for those of you who are dismayed about your stock portfolio right now, don't worry, just don't, don't take anything out. Wait seven years before you take something out. Don't, don't sell, right? Don't sell right now. Now is not, now is not the time to sell. Anyway, um, so yes, and lots of other ideas. Uh, Tracy says, I would be showing and making small ways on how to massage, you know, teaching kids within the family, including the power of touch, since we're all distancing. Yeah, the power of touch is more important than ever. And so, oh, Tracy, did you want to also share something? Oh, I'm, I'm steadily getting creative as everybody else. So I'm so grateful I'm here because we all need so much support at the moment and we're all having to pivot really fast. So there's an area of excitement around it as much as concern. Yes. Um, and I've had to shut my clinic down today. Oh. So um, I do energetic remote healing. So I'm very yeah. lucky in that I just could get all the copy up and running. And so, you know, I'm loving yeah. it, but yeah. it's just... Full on. It so is. <laughs> self care is really, really important right now because we're all feeling collectively the energy around us. Mm -hmm. So whilst we're boosting up and changing our businesses, it's just so important we look after ourselves too. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So it, it, it is, you know, and um, you know, Tracy made the point, right? Like, like in times like this, it's even more important for people to get support for people to to be willing to get support, pay for that support, et cetera. Uh, because otherwise what happens, you know, then this is where you, it's not that we're being opportunistic and we're preying on the vulnerable. I think, see the problem with these things is that sometimes we can be too judgmental of ourselves and maybe of others. Okay. But, but we, we need to say, hey, listen, we need to say to our audience, honestly, Listen, these are times where people can either spiral into negativity and kind of set themselves back, set their own progress back by years, or it's time where you are especially sensitive to receiving support. Because now if you receive support, you're very, very open to it. You're very sensitive to it. And so you might actually grow more from the support that you're getting now because it's such a kind of transformational time. It's, a, it's, it's very open right now, right? People's uh, psyche and their uh, availability um, for, for, for change. Well, because change is being forced on them. So, so to, to, to go back to that earlier conversation, well, how do we do this and not be opportunistic, not be preying on the vulnerable? You need to offer tiers of support. This is, where, this is how you do it, right? And I should have said that earlier, tiers of support. I've got my one-to-one, -one, which you all know, I, I, I do this one-to-one. -one. I love offering this people. This is available right now, especially online. So please book with me. Here's the link. If you cannot afford the one-to-one -one right now, I have online courses or I have a group program 
what is a group program versus online course? A group, a group program is basically an online course plus a Facebook group and additional live calls. That's what a group program is. Let's keep it really simple, people. Really simple. Group program equals online course plus Facebook private group plus additional live calls. You know, that's it. Just keep it simple. Just do it that model. If you have any other complications, let me know. But okay. So that's the second tier. If you can't afford my one-on-one, -on -one, consider my group program. If you can't afford that, consider the online course. If you can't, you know, you might want to not want to have that many options, but, but a, a final option you should have is some kind of free option for them. If you can't afford anything right now, but you still need my support, I am doing a monthly free, you know, group uh, call to support you in that, you know, or whatever, or here's my list of videos or my list of blog, my best blog posts. So have tiers for people. To, to access you at, at whatever level they, they can right now. And this is really true at any time, even not during a crisis, people have different budgets and people have different you know, possibilities, right? Um, there are a lot of wonderful um, uh, chats. Thank you, Bonnie and, and Shweta and Ian and Carol and Jeremy and uh, Jeffrey, Judith, uh, Leah. So, a lot of helpful chats, Gigi. Um, please, those of you who are watching this later, look below for a link to the chat log so that you can see what all the ideas are for how you might want to, especially for those who are hands-on, how you can bring your, your offerings, ideas to bring your offerings online. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, all right, Denise says, what are, the, what are the best online platforms for workshops? All right, great. Let's keep it really simple. Just use Zoom, okay? Because Zoom has the possibility of doing breakout groups. And, you know, Zoom has just about everything you need. So, um, you know, what, what I recommend is, you know, I, I use the $15 a month version of Zoom. And I have been for years. So that's really all you need, $15 a month. It's really affordable. You can have unlimited numbers of meetings. You can have up to 100 people per meeting. What, what more do you need, okay? You can have breakout groups if you need to. Uh, I have a Zoom tutorial, and I literally am asking, what else do you need? Because if it doesn't provide something you need, let me know. There might be something else I would recommend to you. Um, and Bonnie just chatted about my, my free tutorial on Zoom. Thank you, Bonnie. Yes, I, I actually, uh, check this out. You go to YouTube and search um, Zoom tutorial George Cow. I have a Zoom tutorial that is, that is over 800,000 views now. <laughs> Most of those 800,000 views happened in the past couple of weeks because, of course, every teacher on the planet almost is now needing to use something like Zoom. So a lot of people are watching my Zoom tutorial. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, it's probably going to get to a million uh, by, you know, by the end of April, let's say. And it was recorded uh, actually about three years ago. It was a 2017 version of Zoom. And I, I haven't updated it. And still people are watching it. People are appreciating it. So that's one of the, what's one of the key learnings for you all is uh, YouTube is for long-term video growth. Facebook is for short-term video views. YouTube is for long-term. So uh, just, know, just know that. Okay, let's keep going. Tara, thank you for your question. Says, what is the most economical way? Uh, let's see here. Bonnie's next. So let's see here. So Tara says, um, uh, what is the most economical way to post ads? Okay, and what is the least you can expect to spend to be effective? I realize this is subjective and individual, but clients keep asking. And now, Tara, I'm pretty sure she's asking about Facebook ads because, of course, that's something that I'm really good at now, and I've, 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 I've just surpassed spending $25,000 personally, personally, in my own business, not in clients' businesses. In my own business, I've surpassed $25,000 in Facebook ads, and I have, I have done over 1000 campaigns over a thousand i just checked I, I surpassed that number now over a thousand campaigns yay so i know something about facebook ads and the most economical way of doing it um well i teach an entire course on it so i i, I can't tell you for seven hours of content right now but what i will say uh, just maybe a couple of um well here's what i'll do is uh i will um i actually i actually uh wanted to also mention that in the first Q&A call that I did earlier today, which is also on YouTube, if you search, um, if you search George Cow March 23, okay, 
part one, okay, which, which I uploaded just a few hours ago. Part one has my Facebook ads 101 uh, teaching. I spend a few minutes on that. So actually, I think I'm going to leave it at that because we have a lot more questions. And that is really where I show you how to, you know, how to set your budget. I, I just went into it a little bit. And, um, and, by, and by the way, right now, you know, March, probably March through my 2020 uh, rest of the year, is the best time to invest in FB ads because it's the cheapest, the cheapest it's ever been. Well, well, it's it's been since you know it's it's been since probably probably 2015. So I have been running lots of ads in the past couple of years and I have never seen it this cheap. And I I've, I started running ads very actively probably in 2016. So yeah, it's been cheaper than I've ever seen it. So if you want to reach a lot of people right now, people are looking at Facebook more than they've ever had before. And a lot of corporate advertisers are pulling back right now. So if you want to, well, if you want to run it, experiment, it's really cheap to experiment right now. If you want to experiment very effectively uh, with my guidance, then please uh, look at my Facebook workshop and mastermind group. Um, it'll, it's $300, but it'll save you probably thousands of dollars in experimentation over time so check it out um i honestly recommend it i think it's a very uh, effective course okay so let's go down to talk about uh this question with bonnie so thank you bonnie for submitting your question bonnie's actually here with us live so bonnie if you have anything you want to share uh, about your question you can unmute and, and say hello um so bonnie says how do you manage email addresses you collect when you create a course or do a sign up for some kind of special call, special webinar, or something or other product. I'm guessing I'm asking you to use a CRM or funnel software and how you manage that process. I want to launch my first course. I want to keep track of people who signed up specifically for that course so I can email them during the course instead of my entire database. Yes, of course, that makes sense. Um, so you mentioned CRM, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, gift you all with my CRM template. All right, and this is something I teach in one of my courses, but so I'm not going to talk in depth about this today, but I want to gift it to you and you can basically um, try to figure it out on your own or buy one of my courses, come to a bonus Q&A and we will talk a lot more about this, but it's basically, um, this is what I use. And when you come into this template, basically go in here and click on file and click on make a copy and you will be able to make your own private copy to use for yourself. So that's what I use as a CRM to track clients one-to-one, -one, but it's not what I do for courses. So CRM uh, for one-on-one -on -one clients and you know, you know potential clients, right? That's, that's what I follow up with. Um, for courses and products, I use MailChimp, um, specific lists. So what I do, is that uh, I'm not gonna open MailChimp because I don't wanna reveal you know, private data, but I basically create a, a list in MailChimp. Um, I create a list, oh, and uh, my, my lighting is changing, so let me, uh, let me switch my thing, okay. I create a list in MailChimp called, just create a list called students, okay, for your courses, basically. And then inside that MailChimp list, I've, I then create group, uh, a, a group called which class did they take? And in that group, I have subgroups for the specific classes they took or, or, or will take. And what happens is I have integrated my MailChimp with PayPal. And the way I integrate MailChimp and PayPal is using Zapier. So let me just make a few notes here for you to see on screen, right? Uh, Zapier.com connects, connects MailChimp with PayPal um, as many products as you, as you want. So I have many, I have like over a dozen courses now and whenever people buy a particular course on PayPal, okay, they buy a particular course on PayPal and then Zapier recognizes the course name, and then Zapier adds them, adds their email address and name into the correct MailChimp group. 
because remember I said I have a MailChimp list called students and within that list is a subgroup for the, all the different courses. So Zapier knows to add, oh, they bought the, uh, the, the course, my intro course, great. Add them to the subgroup called intro course. And then once Zapier adds them to the subgroup, then I have a second automation that kicks in, which is MailChimp also has automations. So I set up a mail, I've set up a MailChimp automation such that for people who join the intro course group, please send them this email. And that email then includes, you know, uh, the access information to the course. And, and then if I want to send any updates about the course, I can simply send it to people in that MailChimp list for that specific group. So um, Bonnie says, do you use the free MailChimp? Well, it's been you know a long time since I've paid for Mailchimp, so I use the paid Mailchimp uh, thing. Um, I think you might need to pay for Mailchimp to use the automation. Um, but if you wanted to use the free Mailchimp, here's how you do it. Instead of setting up one list called students and having multiple groups, you need to set up separate list for each course. Separate list for each course, and so when people join a list, you know how they get sent a confirmation email? I think this will work. I'm, I'm trying to talk it through. I think this will work. When people join a list, they get a confirmation email. Well, if you have separate lists per course, then you can customize the confirmation email, the welcome email for, you know, uh, for the course info. But what I'm, what I'm wondering, what I'm questioning is whether, um, people will, uh, whether when Zapier adds the name to the list, whether MailChimp knows that it's a new subscriber to send out the final welcome email. So you might have to check on that. If that doesn't work, you can still use the free MailChimp, but ask Zapier that Zapier is, a, is like an assistant, but it's a robot, right? So you can say, hey, when someone buys my intro course, add them to this MailChimp list. And also the next action to do is send them this email. So Zapier can do that for you, but Zapier says, well, how, how will I send the, the email? You, you can say, you use my email address or whatever, use my email account, use Gmail, right, to do it. So it's kind of hacking it together, but really the more elegant solution is to pay for MailChimp and just do it that way, like I just explained earlier. So anyway, um, oh, Ian, Ian White, thank you. Ian says, um, you can use automation with a free, you can use a MailChimp automation for free on MailChimp, but it depends on how many people you have on your lists. And each list you set up on MailChimp, you know, they all add up to how many subscribers you have. So you gotta be careful on that. Okay, so I hope that helps. I don't wanna get too much into the weeds, but I hope this helps Bonnie to give you some directions and some, uh, some ideas, then you can, you can use Zapier or MailChimp contact customer service and work it out with them. All right, Ruby says, is it possible to start an online counseling practice at this time? I have a master and blah, blah, blah. I am very orthodox. Okay. I would especially like to, to be available for people who are suffering at this time and for others seeking support. So I think hopefully our conversation thus far in this video has been helpful, Ruby, to you. So basically the answer is, of course, yes. And, you know, to refer back to my, um, to my blog post, you know, uh, business models blog post. Um, hold on a second here. What did I? Okay, business model, right? So refer back to this. You would look at this and say how you might you set up your business model for your online practice. And in terms of you know, if you're really new to online uh, counseling then I would recommend that you start with friends. So give gift sessions to supportive friends of yours who know your work and would be willing to try it out or clients of yours who have done work with you in person and now you want to do it online, try it out with them. You know, gift like a dozen sessions to different people, uh, gift one session to a, a dozen different people to give you feedback and testimonials, right? And of course, they may be so grateful that and they may enjoy it so much, they might start giving referrals to your your first online clients, right? And then the other thing that's really, really important is to start building um, an online audience. Otherwise, who's gonna buy more from you other than your own friends? Of course, you start with your friends and their referrals, 
but then you need probably need to grow beyond that to reach a full-time income. And that's why you need to build an online audience and Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube are really the, my recommended places these days to build an online audience. And, um, we'll just leave it at that. There's a lot we can say about that, but we'll just leave it at that for now. Um, and Bonnie Douglas, thank you. Bonnie says, Hey, I'm, I'm an example of that. I do teletherapy. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And my, my wife does so as well. She has seen clients mostly in person, but now of course, given that she sees clients mostly online. So, okay. Elena, um, hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, says so far, I only provide in-person sessions and workshops due to the situation of offering online services. Now online payment is new for me. Are you happy with PayPal, George? Yes, I am. Do you have any advice or practical tips for beginners on using PayPal? Yes. So with PayPal, let me um, just log into my PayPal account and then I'll show you a little bit about what you might want to do. Uh, and by the way, as I'm going through this, those of you who are live here, any follow-up questions, anything, feel, please feel free to ask. Okay, so um, let me show you my PayPal, the PayPal buttons. So really, when you use PayPal for online payment, you need to learn how to use, how to create PayPal buttons. Okay, make a PayPal button. And to do that, you log into your PayPal account. Okay, you might need to upgrade to the business account. Uh, account settings, I don't know if it's there. Um, account type, mm, let's see here. Uh, account preferences maybe? Yes, account type, business. Having a business account on PayPal, it's still free. It's free. I don't pay anything except per transaction. I pay, just assume that you're going you're gonna to pay about 3% per transaction on PayPal. Sometimes it's less than 3%. Sometimes it's you know, more. If it's international transactions, it might be 4.5%. But just know that that's very normal. Don't don't complain about the, the percentage. Just expect that whenever you do online transactions, just expect three to 5%. Credit card you know, and processing transactions, three to 5% is not unusual. Just accept it. Just accept that's a cost of business. All right, and then uh, when you, once you've got a business account, go to tools and then PayPal buttons. And I will tell you, these are the buttons I use. I use buy now button, which is a single purchase, single payment rather. People buy an online course or they buy one session from me or whatever, the buy now button. And then the only other button I use is the subscribe button. The subscribe button is for ongoing payments. So if they join your group program or they have a one-on-one -on -one service with you that um, is basically they pay you every week or every month, then the subscribe button is what you need. So for example, if I'm going to click on the subscribe button, let's create one just to show you what it looks like. Okay. And uh, yes, does someone have uh, Shweta? Yes. Hi. Hi, George. Um, you can finish talking about PayPal. I think I'm not sure if you are. I had a question around Zoom and PayPal together. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let me talk about this first. So, yeah. so when you're creating uh, a subscribe button, ongoing payment, so let's say, you know, ongoing group program or whatever you want to call it. Uh, this is something that the, the, the customer client actually sees when they receive their invoice. So name it something that's, that's, they're going to understand and that makes sense for them. And then um, uh, you could even add prices, you know, if it's going to be this much monthly or that much monthly and different options, you can name what the different options are, program A, program B, program C or whatever, or you can create different subscribe buttons for the different programs. But this is another way of doing it. Uh, so if you want to do different, if it's like one program, but different tiers that you might want to do it with the drop down menu instead. And then um, don't worry about that. I don't, I don't really do that. I don't do that. I, I do the, uh, I create my own uh, membership by, by using Facebook group and MailChimp, that kind of thing. Building amount per cycle. So if you're charging them, you know, $50 a month or $50 uh, a week or $50 a day, <laughs> you could even do that. You could, you know, um, per, per billing cycle per month or for every other month or for every three months you charge them, whatever billing cycle, again, you can use that number and every other week or every other day or whatever you want to do is there. And how many cycles? So let's say it's a 12 month program. It would be 12 billings before they end or a three month program. It's a three billings before it ends. You could offer a trial period at a different rate if you wanted to. And then finally, uh, step three is where I usually go after that. You can take customers 
or uh, after they finish checkout, you can bring them to a thank you page, you know, georgehout.com slash thank you or whatever you want to do, or georgehout.com slash group program thank you, and that'll give them some information, what to look for in their email address, et cetera, et cetera. And then you finally, uh, you click on create button. I don't know if I did everything correctly, but um, yeah, create button. And this is the code. You click it once. You click select code. Uh, and, you know, do Command C on your keyboard or Control C, to, uh, Control C on Windows, Command C on a Mac to copy it. This is what you paste as a code on your website. If you don't know how to do code on your website, ask your web person. Uh, or you can do a single. This is a this is a trick I want to show you. Very important. Okay, click on the email tab to get a single link that you can send in an email or put on a website or put on Facebook, a single link that is basically the same thing as the PayPal button, except on, a, on, website, or on your email or on social media, you can't paste this code. It wouldn't make sense for social media. You gotta do this email link for social media or for email or you know, when you're chatting someone, say, oh yeah, here's a link to pay, to pay for my program or whatever like that. So that is the big trick that a lot of people don't know. And uh, that's why I wanted to show that to you. Okay. Um, all right. So I hope that helps, uh, Elena. And um, the donation button, by the way, um, I don't recommend because that's really for nonprofits. And I think PayPal could basically, uh, you know, give you trouble if you're not a nonprofit and you still use the donate button. So I don't recommend the donate button. Just to keep keep things on the level, keep things legit with PayPal. Okay. All right. So Shweta, you said you had some questions about PayPal and. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I've never used, um, I have to do a lot of physical stuff online now. So, yes, yes. Uh, finally. Yeah. Um, and I, I've been using free Zoom for my small group things and yes. also fun. So I've never really needed the paid version, but now I have to upgrade to that. And I know I read about the integration part of paying doing the pay because I've been part of things where you register and immediately the thing comes uh, register and pay. Uh -huh. um, oh yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, um, I bet Zoom, Zoom has a registration type thing. I don't know if you've looked into that before, but um, let me- Yeah, I was me... wondering like, are there certain plans only that can do that or uh, any plan Zoom can do that? Register meeting. Or if others have also now. experienced yeah, with... um, registration for meetings. So there is something about this. I have never used the Zoom registration, um, but uh, I don't know. The, the question I would have for Zoom registration is, can I customize the email? Because if I can customize the email, then I can say, well, I, lots of useful things. Um, yeah, so you might want to Google this, you know, Zoom registration mm -hmm. for meetings. Google that and see if it's useful. Yeah, Give because it, it seems, you know, I'm trying to keep it simple and it seems like, you know, people don't have to go through multiple hoops because I started yeah. doing Eventbrite and then I'm like, yeah. wait, what am I doing? This is too many steps in the process. And for me, coordinating on my end on wait, a very short... Hold on a second. So Eventbrite, though, is not too many steps because you can customize a confirmation email for Eventbrite, correct? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So if you customize you pay on there too, so is it cheaper to do it on Zoom or Eventbrite? I don't know. Do yeah, I, I, because I haven't used Eventbrite and I haven't used right. registration on Zoom. So I would say you have to test that out. Yeah. Okay. And the other way you could do it is through Mailchimp opt-in. I mean, you basically give people a link to pay on PayPal, and then once they pay, right? Once they pay on PayPal, they get automatically uh, transferred over to that Mailchimp registration and they can mm -hmm. you know um but the thing is if people don't aren't patient after they pay they, they're not patient they don't get transferred to the mailchimp opt-in then that's a problem so right, exactly. yeah i think i think that um you know you have to probably put together a web page for this right like a web page for signing up mm -hmm. there's a paypal button uh and then yeah. after they pay i would i would use zap i don't know yeah this is why i use zapier and you kind of have to you put a put a solution that's really reliable together mm -hmm. that you can use again and again and again. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. If other people on the call, if you guys know anything about and um, anything that we just talked about, please chat it in. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. 
Okay, so Nancy says, how do I set up the pay what you can? Pay what you want, pay what you can course on PayPal. All right, what's your experience with this? So I would encourage you to set up a PayPal button for, um, for you, know, you use the buy now button and then uh, let's see here. Let's see if we can get to the get to the right page. Whoops. Okay, let me let me uh, get to the right page first, and then pay what you can is a really tricky business model. It feels so good, right? It feels so right to let people pay you what they can. It sounds good. I get it but have you really tried it in practice? And do you know how much of a cluster it is right, to do it in practice? It sounds idealistic and good, but I get it. But the people who use pay what you can successfully, you know what they do? They set a bottom, they set a minimum. Like Mark Silver, he does it successfully. His group is pay what you can, but that's plus and minus $95 a month. It's not just, hey, I feel like paying $4 a month. Can I do that? Well, you can, but you know, he gives you very clear guidance on what you might want to pay. Another guy who does it successfully is Zoe Toby, right? And um, in fact, I have a, see if I can find it actually. I have a whole interview I did with Zoe on how he does pay what you can effectively. And let me see if I can find it here. A Zoe Toby. George Cow, pay what you can. Um, see here. There it is. All right. October 2018. That's the one. Okay. So he does very successful pay what you can model. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, if you if you if you can't find the link, I'll try to put the link in, in the com in the description of the video. If you can't find it, just Google, uh, not Google, go to Facebook and search PWYC Zoe Toby, just like how it's spelled, two words, uh, PWYC Zoe Toby George Cow, and you'll, you'll inevitably find this video. It's 2000, October 2018. And um, he gives a guidance. He doesn't say, well, oh, pay a dollar, pay a thousand dollars, whatever you want. It's essentially, he gives three options. If you are struggling financially, pay this amount. If you are doing okay financially, pay this amount. If you're doing really well financially, pay, pay this amount, which then supports other people who can't pay as much. So it's a very thoughtful process. And that webinar will show you the page and show you everything, okay? So therefore, if you're going to do it thoughtfully like Zoe does and like Mark does, then you should create a PayPal button, a buy, a buy now button, okay? And then, uh, do this, click on this drop down menu and add three options. Struggling financially, okay, pay whatever, $100. Um, doing okay financially, pay 150, right? Okay, doing great financially, pay 200. Okay, whatever, whatever it may be, and click done. And then, you know, people will be able to see this drop down menu. And by the way, <laughs> you might want to put the first option not as struggling financially, right? You could do the first option as doing okay financially, right? 150, struggling, struggling, um, you know, 100. So you can do it that way, right? So then when they click on this, um, they, could, they could see those three options. So that's what I would recommend, right? Don't let people just willy-nilly figure out a price. Plus, it's not, that, it's not that people are going to be stingy on you. It's not that. It's that people don't want to offend you. So they won't even buy. They're like, oh, pay what you want. Well, I don't want to offend Ian. I don't want to offend Shweta. So I think I'll pass for now, you know, right? You don't give me any education on what I should pay you. I don't know what I should pay you, right? Please stop this madness of pay what you can without education, right? So um, uh, not that Nancy is doing it that way, but I, I see a lot of people like, idealists who don't realize the reality of what's what people are thinking about right all right so let's go down to the question from Claire Kennedy what is the most valuable and important information I could get out of my first Facebook ad and how do I use it all right so uh, I 
uh, because there's so much I can say on this, and I, of course, go into a lot of depth in my Facebook course, I will just give you a couple of quick pointers um, in that your, your first Facebook ad, congratulations. If you are testing a cool audience, okay, what I mean is that if you are trying to reach people that, who don't know you and you're trying out the audience targeting on Facebook, the most important thing you need to do is to study their profiles. Meaning when people, people who you ran an ad to, they liked your, your post, click on who liked your post, go to their profile and whatever public information you can see about them, including their cover photo. It's always public, right? Cover photo is always public and their likes. You click on, go to their profile, hover over more, click on likes. That's usually public as well. You get a sense of, did I reach the right person? Do they like the things that are relevant to my services, related to my services? That's the most important thing you can do when you're first getting started on Facebook, test cold audiences. You got to find the right people. I teach my students how to find the right people so that they can spend money wisely on Facebook, reaching the right people, finally, yay. And then the second thing you need to know about comparing your Facebook ad results, it's not compared to like, well, what does George say is a good ad result? Is it this much cost per like, cost per conversion, cost per lead? No, you compare it with your own ad history because Everybody has a different audience. Everybody has a different relationship to their audience, different products, different content. So how can you compare to what my average is or anybody else's average is? And it's probably really, really hard to find the industry average in your audience and again, in your industry. But again, your industry average is gonna be different because, or your, your averages are gonna be different because you have a different audience, different content, all this other stuff. Different way of running ads. How are you comparing apples to apples? Compare with your own ads. That's why you need a history you know, you run three Facebook ads to the same audience, same type of ad, if it's all text or if it's video, that all needs to be compared. You can't compare a text ad with a video ad or a link ad with a lead generation ad. You can't compare that. You can't say this it was a good ad or a not good ad. It's all like, okay, I ran three ads, same audience, same format, same, you know, uh, similar topics, right? Same amount of money, okay? And this is what happened. Now we're talking. Now we can compare it to say, okay, based on these three ads, it showed us a lot about which topic they really wanted. Or maybe you ran the exact same ad to three audiences. Okay, now we can say, let's compare these three audiences. So it's, it's really about comparing with your own history, not about whether something was good or not. So I hope this is helpful for a little bit of insight on um, how you approach knowing whether it was valuable or not, right? It was whether it was helpful or not. All right, Suna Lin asks, I have some offers to make on programs that I've I already established through nonprofits and especially high school students, young adults. The organizations cannot share the student information. So then how can I reach them on social media when I have not been active and not connected to their groups? Facebook ads, right? The great thing about Facebook ads is you can literally target specific you could literally target specific uh, age groups as well as specific high schools so literally if you say oh I want to uh, hey can anyone name a large high school in, in the chat uh, let me see if I can figure one out uh, let's see here um, Lowell High School Lowell High School there you go all right Lowell High School and there's Lowell High School, Massachusetts. I think this one is the one in San Francisco. It's pretty famous. So I can target a large high school. And why is it 113,000 people? This is all the people who are either current students or past students. And of course, if you are targeting a single high school, you could say, well, I want, I want current students and, uh, or their parents, right? Or people who are alumni, but you could target it based on age, right? And, and you could say people who, who like Lowell High School, who are also parents, right? Parents, parents of children of teenagers. There you go. All right, so now I'm targeting fewer than a thousand people, but it might be like a couple hundred people, right? It might be a couple hundred people, uh, US, um, 
but it might not work. So you might want to do multiple high schools. So you could put in multiple high income, you know, high schools and high income neighborhoods uh, that are also must match parents with teenagers. And that's a way to reach parents, decision makers usually, right? So there you go. And the other thing is you need to, other, other than Facebook ads that are super easy to target the right people, you can also um, connect with uh, influencers and organizations. So you basically, you ask the question, who is the decision maker for your services and your programs? Who is the decision maker? And of the decision makers, right, where do they get their information? What blogs do they read? What associations are they part of? What video channels do they watch? What, you know, YouTube channels? What um, websites do they go to? And you partner with those blogs, those video channels, th those associations, those websites. Okay, so I hope that helps, Sunilin. Next is Renee. Thank you for your patience. Renee um, was there in the morning call as well. I don't know if she's here, but anyway, I'm going to answer her question. She says, I'm starting about, I'm thinking about starting a new uh, business doing simple plant-based meal plans during this time. Great. I'm unclear how to do research, know who I'm serving, how to frame my services, what my services can and will be, how to communicate with them on a website. Okay, sometimes I can get wrapped up in detail, she says. Can you offer any guidance about the getting started process? Absolutely. Okay, so really, this is the overall process that you need to do. You need to build an audience first based, okay, well, actually, if you're really anxious even about building your audience, then I would say this, who among your friends and um, people you know, people you know, you know, okay. Who among the people you know are similar to your ideal client or might be similar? If you, if you don't know who your ideal client is. Yes. You can also post this question to your FB profile, newsfeed, right? You post this question and your supportive friends will come to, you know, come to uh, your aid to say, oh, well, yes, I, I, you know, basically the question would be, hey, who among you might be interested or do, who, who should I be uh, who should I be really aiming my marketing towards if I'm trying to sell plant-based meal planning at this time? Do any of you, my, any of you, the type of people who would buy this kind of thing? Could I talk with you? You know, so your friends are, might be the free first people that you, that you uh, connect with. My, my preferred method is to build an audience of basically you sharing whatever free information you're willing to share, usually free information. I've talked about this in other places, but Free information is not detailed how-to information. That's not what I recommend. I recommend free information, except for this. This free call is a support call, so I can go get into some how-tos. But notice most of my free content is more ins inspirational, motivational, educating people on the context of my work and not the how-tos. Okay, so create content that's in that kind of way, and then use ads or use connections with influencers to get the content out there you build your audience and then you talk to your audience you you connect with them one-to-one -one and do market research conversations um, or surveys okay the other thing you can do that's also very useful for beginners is a niche mate study a niche mate is somebody who offers another business basically who offers something very similar to yours that you want to offer or service a similar audience and you study their website right you study their website you study how they're making offers and who the testimonials are coming from notice the people giving testimonials what kind of people are they that gives you clues into who, you, who your ideal clients are probably who probably are and by the way niche mates can become partners too because maybe they have maybe they're not interested in offering meal plans and they can refer those clients to you or maybe they have too many clients they could, you know, successful people can refer people to you, right? So I hope this is helpful, uh, Renee. And, oh, and she also says, I have two skill sets that seem unrelated. Design, branding, blah, 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 marketing, and second in food, plant-based, lifestyle, energy medicine. I'm new, I can see both skill sets overlapping. I'm not sure how. If the skill sets are not related, you know, business versus plant-based or energy medicine, 
don't try to mash them together into some weird Frankenstein type of business. Uh, I mean, you could, you could say, Hey, plant-based lifestyle for people in business. I mean, you could, if it makes sense, but some people try too hard to mash things together and it just kind of feels weird. So if it's, if it's really separated, I mean, you might want to, you know, really focus your marketing on the thing that you're most passionate on and the thing that you're a little bit less passionate on. You can get that kind of business through word of mouth, through one-on-one -on -one referrals, that kind of thing. That's what I recommend. Okay. So I think with that, um, I think we're out of time, but I, I do want to answer a question here from Ian uh, that says, says this, do Facebook ads really work? I find myself scrolling past them. Okay. All right. So let's be really clear here. What is a Facebook ad? Okay. You might say, oh, a Facebook ad is the thing on the right hand side. That is one type of Facebook ad. Okay. Another type of Facebook ad is, all right, um, this. You're scrolling in the news feed and you see what looks like a post, but it's actually an ad and you know it's an ad because it says sponsored. Okay, and let, let's keep going. And this is, hey, Tina Huang, Ali Katz, and two others like, so it'll try to make it more friendly for you by saying, hey, you've got some friends. It'll try to get your attention. Hey, you've got some friends who also like this page. You've got some friends who also like Ian, right? So let, let's keep going here. Another, another Facebook ad that's in the feed. Let's see if we can find one. Ah, sponsored, Chipotle. All right, sponsored. Um, so, even if you, Ian, you say you scroll past them. Well, it's, you know why you scroll past them? Because those ads were poorly targeted. You actually weren't the ideal viewer for that ad. But if ads are correctly targeted, you won't scroll past them. You'll go, wait, I'm actually interested in this. Oh, interesting. Now, the ads that I place are different from the ads that we usually see. The ads that we usually see look very much like ads. The ads that I place, especially to cool audiences, this is part of my course, and I, I talked about Facebook Ads 101 in the previous call, so look for March YouTube, search George Cow, March 23, part one, and at the end of the call, like the last, uh, I think 10, 10, 15 minutes, I do a Facebook Ads 101. The kind of ads I place don't look like ads, and that's why people respond to them. The ads I place are text only, no images, no images. I place two types of, two formats of ads, text only ads, what, well, three, three types, sorry. Text only ads to cool audiences, okay. Video to warm audiences, and my videos don't look produced. They look just like this, I am talking, so it looks like some guy talking, like a friend kind of talk, not like, get your attention with wonderful, you know, that looks like an ad, right? And plus, I'm too lazy to do that stuff anyway. So I just show up and talk, right? Hey, it works, but it works. It works because I zig where others zag. You see what I mean? All the advertisers are making stuff that look like ads. I make stuff that don't look like ads. And that's what I recommend people do as well. So text only posts to cool audiences. So they're like scrolling and they're like, if, if, if the first couple lines are on a topic that they're actually caring about, but they, they, they actually have a problem in their life, that a few lines you actually address or start talking about that, the reticular activation system in their brain, which is the, the part of the brain that sees the red sports car, because you've been thinking about buying a red sports car and suddenly you go outside, all you see, are, not all you see, but you see more red cars than you've ever seen before, reticular activation system. Whatever problem or whatever goal you have that you're thinking actively about, when people are scrolling and a few lines catches that topic, they will, they will read. So text only ads to cool audiences, videos like this to warm audiences. And then I do a third type of ad, which is boosted Facebook events. Work really well. Boosted Facebook events to warm audiences, inviting them to something like this or inviting them to a course or a webinar or something like that. So I hope that helps. It really does work. Um, I, that's why I spend so much money on it because it returns higher than, much higher than what I spend. So, um, and Jeffrey says, that's exactly how I found George. A random Facebook ad suddenly came through my newsfeed and here, here he is, right? Yeah, and you know, the ads I ran to, to cool audience, people like Jeffrey who didn't know me was text only. It was not selling anything, it was simply educating, inspiring, nurturing. And guess what? 
I've reached people who are thoughtful people who don't mind reading. And that's the kind of people you want to reach to. And the people who are not wanting to read even on topics they're interested in, they'll keep scrolling. And that's a blessing because you won't be spending money on them, right? You really spend money on the people, especially when we're running ads to cool audiences. We're running engagement. That's the campaign objective is engagement. So you're only charged. They're looking for people who will engage, who will actually read stuff or like things. The problem with running engagement ads and you have an image, here's the problem. You get a lot of people who just like to like images. Oh, pretty flower, nice mountain, nice profile picture. And they like image, they don't even read it. That's why I say text only ads, engagement, cool audiences. And now you're reaching people who like to read, who like to think, who like to be thoughtful. And if they're reading your stuff, they get educated by you. And now they're part of your warm audience. You run video ads to them. Now you're building a relationship with them. And then next time you run a Facebook event ad, they're like, oh, I want to hang out with this guy. There you go. So I hope this helps. I hope this makes sense. And uh, I apologize to the people who submitted questions in advance that I didn't get to. But I hope that this was a lot of information that was helpful to, to, to you anyway. So with that, I want to say one more thing. Um, let me please uh, give me three minutes if you want to. If you need to go, please feel free to get going. But I want to give me three minutes of advertising time, <laughs> okay? So uh, I really recommend if you do free webinars like this, don't, don't, don't just do three minutes at the end. You should 10% of your free webinar should be selling something or at least telling people gently, caringly, friendly about your services and your products. So I, I just want to mention, if you liked this uh, Q&A call, I do this kind of thing. Um, you know, uh, every single month for my students, people who buy any of my courses. And if you want to, if you have a low budget, like I said, go to my website, go to workshops, click on the intro workshop. That's my cheapest course right now. $50 one time. You'll get a lot of really useful business planning, marketing planning information. In addition, you get access to two months of these bonus Q and A's. And if I do any more free Q and A's, of course you'll have access to that, but you get access to the student only bonus Q and A's where I, I feel like you get into even more detail, more of the how to's. My bonus Q and A, I don't hold anything back. I go into all the how to's for anything you want to ask me, Facebook ads, you know, MailChimp, whatever you want to ask me on this bonus Q and A's, I will answer with screencast and things like that. So just buy my cheapest course, get in, into the two months of this and next time buy my next cheapest course, which is probably, uh, uh, the content writing one, <laughs> I think so. So, all right. So with that, I hope this helps and thank you again, genuinely. Thank you for caring enough about my content to even be here or to watch it. Uh, truly thank you because there's a lot of other content creators out there. So thank you so much and I'll see you next time in some other video. All right. Take care. Thanks everybody. Bye for now.